Hey everyone, welcome back to Shane by Jack Schaefer. I'm Jesse McCarthy reading it aloud to you. So last time, I mean, the ending was intense because that big guy Morgan was just out cold. We had lights out, like he's just, he's done. Uh, we don't know exactly what happened to him, but he's not getting up at least right now. And so Shane took out a bunch of guys that tried to jump him um, to really just beat him up seriously beat him up and run him out of town uh, at the bar when the start family was just in town hanging out having a good time. Uh, Shane almost beat all of them up on his own. And then at the last minute, it seemed like he was falling or something might have happened to him. And Joe walked in at that moment and just rage took over that man. And they both cleaned up shop in a sense, got rid of the guys that came to attack them. So they were obviously acting in self-defense here. This wasn't like they went and ambushed a group of people. They were actually the ones being ambushed, or at least Shane was, and then Joe helped out. Um, and they had Marion and Bob actually watch the thing. So everybody was there. And now we're going to hop in right after, I think, Morgan fell, like right in that moment. So here we go, chapter 10. In the hush that followed Morgan's fall, the big bar room was so quiet again that the rustle of Will Atke straightening from below the bar level was loud and clear, and Will stopped moving, embarrassed and a little frightened. Shane looked neither at him nor at any of the other men staring from the wall. He looked only at us, at father and mother and me, and it seemed to me that it hurt him to see us there. He breathed deeply and his chest filled and he held it, held it long and achingly and released it slowly and sighing. Suddenly you were impressed by the fact that he was quiet, that he was still. You saw how battered and bloody he was. In the moments before you saw only the splendor of movement, the flowing brute beauty of line and power and action. The man you felt was tireless and indestructible now that he was still and the fire in him banked and subsided, you saw and in the scene remembered that he had taken bitter punishment. His shirt collar was dark and sodden. Blood was soaking into it and this, and this came only in part from the cut on his cheek. More was oozing from the matted hair where Morgan's bottle had hit. Unconsciously, he put up one hand and it came away smeared and sticky. He regarded it grimly and wiped it clean on his shirt. He swayed slightly, and when he started toward us, his feet dragged, and he almost fell forward. Just briefly, I don't know if you've ever played an intense sport. Um, I know I played football in high school, and uh, I remember you would, you'd get so worked up in the game, and you're hitting each other and so forth, and you get really beat up pretty badly, but you don't feel any of it in the game. It's only after where you're aware of, like, Oh man, look at all these scrapes all over me. You could have, I mean, it's rare, but you could have even broken a bone, not even realize it because you're just so in the moment. And I think that's what's happened here. Um, one of the townsmen, Mr. Wire, a friendly man who kept the stage post, pushed out from the wall, clucking sympathy as though he to help him. Shane pulled himself erect. His eyes blazed refusal. Straight and superb, not a tremor in him. He came to us and you knew that the spirit in him would sustain him thus alone for the farthest distance and forever. But there was no need. The one man in our valley, the one man I believe in all the world whose help he would take, not to whom he would turn, but whose help he would take, was there and ready. Father stepped to meet him and put out a big arm reaching for his shoulders. All right, Joe, Shane said. So softly, I doubt whether the others in the room heard. His eyes closed and he leaned against father's arm. His body relaxing and his head dropping sideways. Father bent and fitted his other arm under Shane's knees and picked him up like he did me when I stayed up too late and got all drowsy and had to be carried to bed. Can you imagine Joe picks so Shane's a powerful guy, but Joe, just this beast of a man picking Shane up kind of like a child. Father held Shane in his arms and looked over at him, at Mr. Grafton. I'd consider it a favor, Sam, 
if you'd figure the damage and put it on my bill. Remember, the bar is just, I mean, a mess at this point. Table's broken, chair's broken. I'm sure a bunch of liquor and bottles are just gone. And, and Shane is, not Shane, Joe is saying, put the tab on me. I'm paying for everything. Even though they didn't start this fight, he's saying, I'm paying for everything. For a man strict about bills and keen for a bargain, Mr. Grafton surprised me. I'm marking this to Fletcher's account. I'm seeing that he pays. Mr. Wire surprised me even more. He spoke promptly and he was emphatic about it. Listen to me, Sterrett. It's about time this town worked up a little pride. Maybe it's time, too, we got to be more neighborly with you homesteaders. I'll take a collection to cover this. I, I've been ashamed of myself ever since it started tonight, standing here and letting five of them jump that man of yours. Father was pleased, but he knew what he wanted to do. That's mighty nice of you, Ware, but this ain't your fight. I wouldn't worry, was I you, about keeping out of it. He, he looked down at Shane and the pride was plain busting out of him. Matter of fact, I'd say the odds tonight without me butting in was mighty close to even. He looked again at Mr. Grafton. Fletcher ain't getting in on this with a nickel. I'm paying. He tossed back his head. No, by Godfrey, we're paying. Me and Shane. He went to the swinging doors, turning sideways to push them open. Mother took my hand and we followed. She always knew when to talk and when not to talk. And she said no word while we, while we watched Father lift Shane to the wagon seat, climb beside him, hoist him to the sitting position with one arm around him and take the reins in the other hand. Will Atke trotted out with our things and stowed them away. Mother and I perched on the back of the wagon. Father chirruped to the team. And we started home. There was not a sound for quite a stretch except the clop of hooves and the little creakings of the wheels. Then I heard a chuckle up front. It was Shane. The cool air was reviving him and he was sitting straight, swaying with the wagon's motion. What'd you do with that, with that thick one, Joe? I, I, I was busy with the redhead. Oh, I, I just kind of tucked him out of the way. Father wanted to let it go at that. Not mother. He picked him up like, like, a, like a bag of potatoes and threw him clear across the room. She did not say it to Shane, not to any person. She said it to the night, to the sweet darkness around us, and her eyes were shining in the starlight. We turned in at our place, and Father shooed the rest of us into the house while he unhitched the team. In the kitchen, mother set some water to heat on the stove and chased me to bed. Her back was barely to me after she tucked me in before I was peering around the door jam. She got several clean rags, took the water from the stove, and went to work on Shane's head. She was tender as could be, crooning like to herself under her breath the while. It pained him plenty as the warm water soaked into the gash under the matted hair and as she washed the clotted blood from his cheek but it seemed to pain her more for her hands shook at the worst moments. And she was the one who flinched while he sat there quietly and smiled reassuringly to her. Father came back in and sat by the stove watching them. He pulled out his pipe and made a very careful business of packing it and lighting it. She finished. Shane would not let her try a bandage. This air is the best medicine, he said. She had to be content with cleaning the cuts thoroughly and making certain all bleeding had stopped. Then it was father's turn. Get that shirt off, Joe. It's torn all down the back. Let me see what I can do with it. Before he could rise, she had changed her mind. No, we'll keep it just like it is. To remember tonight by. You were magnificent, Joe. Tearing that man away and... Shucks, said father. I was just peeved. Him holding Shane so Morgan could pound him? And you, Shane. Mother was in the middle of the kitchen looking from one to the other. You, you were magnificent, too. 
Morgan w- he was so big and horrible, and yet he didn't have even have a chance. He was so cool and quick and and dangerous. And a woman shouldn't have to see things like that. Shane interrupted her, and he meant it. But she was talking right ahead. You think I shouldn't because it's brutal and nasty, not just fighting to see who is better at it, but mean and vicious and to win by any way, but to win? Of course it is. But you didn't start it. You didn't want to do it. Not until they made you anyway. You did it because you had to. Her voice was climbing and she was looking back and forth and losing control of herself. Did ever a woman have two such men? And she turned from them and reached out blindly for a chair and sank into it and dropped her face into her hands and the tears came. The two men stared at her and then at each other in that adult knowledge beyond my understanding. Shane rose and stepped over by my mother. He put a hand gently on her head and I felt again his fingers in my hair and the affection flooding through me. He walked quietly out the door and into the night. Father drew on his pipe. It was out and and absently he lit it. He rose and went to the door and out on the porch. I could see him there dimly in the darkness, gazing across the river. Gradually, mother's sobs died down. She raised her head and wiped away the tears. Joe. He turned and started in and waited then by the door. She stood up. She stretched her hands toward him and he was there and had her in his arms. Do you think I don't know, Marion? But you don't. Not really. You can't. Because I don't know myself. Father was staring over her head at the kitchen wall, not seeing anything there. Don't fret yourself, Marion. I'm man enough to know it better when his trail meets mine. Whatever happens, we'll be all right. Oh, Joe, Joe, kiss me. Hold me tight and don't ever let go. And that is chapter 10. Oof. So I think part part of it's intense to me just because of the relationship between Joe and Shane. I mean, I'll get back to this Marion thing in a moment, but just to see two two grown men care for each other at that level. Um, sometimes you don't see that a lot in our culture. Like you got to be tough all the time, but you know, they were tough. They fought these guys, but then afterwards they were just really caring for each other. So I think that's something, something awesome about life. Um, if you can find a friend like that, hold on tight. Um, and then let's come back to Marion here. Cause I think it's worth commenting on. I don't know how many of you are picking up on this. And if you're really young, maybe you're not picking up on it at all. Uh, if you're older, you could, I remember when I first read this, I don't know how much I picked up on this, but I think there's a little something going on here with the potential that Marion is attracted to Shane, um, likes him, looks up to him uh, in more than just a friendly way. And it seems that Joe it recognizes it. And Marion herself is confused because she's got these two incredible men. I kind of like them both. Uh, we'll, I mean, we'll see what happens. And obviously she has a deep and long love for Joe and they have a child together, but Shane's this kind of marvelous man from the outside. So this book doesn't shy away from real conflicts in life. And I don't, we tend to think, oh, well, the woman would never think about another man when she's been, who knows, maybe that's the case, or maybe she does. But it's a, they're, they're hitting it head on, like you meet a man like Shane, and this is a strong woman, caring woman, and she's attracted to him. So that's in her mind, how does she deal with that? So that's kind of a side thing in this book, it's not going to become a big theme. But it's just a side uh, issue. If you didn't see it, that's what's kind of going on. If you saw it, that's just confirming what what you probably already saw. Anyways, that is it. Um, You know what? Let's do the face actually of Marion when she's thinking about both of them. She kind of had all this occurrence right before she breaks down crying. And she's just overwhelmed with these emotions. She's got these two marvelous human beings in front of her. 
and that's the face okay it's again i can't see my face so i'm looking dead into the camera but i don't know i'm curious what yours is like all right guys uh thanks for hopping on it's always a pleasure being with you if you want to leave a comment or contact me you can always reach out at jesse j-e-s-s-e at jesse mccarthy.com i always kind of hesitate because i have a few different emails take care everyone uh, until next time adios